you, thank you, yeah. Uh, <coughs> there will be a small activity in the T area where there will be a board that is placed. If you feel that you are not that very well in the quiz, it's an, again an opportunity for you to let your imaginations fly high. Just write down on a sheet of paper what you feel can be done, you or me or whomsoever can be done to get this nonsense disease out of our country. So write it there, the best three quotes on the sheet we will be giving you the prizes at the end of the session. And there is a small photographic place also where you can click your photos and immediately get this stuff out on you. Okay, thank you. Let's join us for the tea in the next call. 11.40 or 11.45, sorry, 11.30 we'll be meeting here again for the next session on pediatric transplants. And you can implant the hematopoietic stem cells and all the blood cells that come from this patient are now the donor's blood cells and therefore you don't have thalassemia and that can be extended to any disorder where there is either a germline mutation which is restricted to the hematopoietic compartment. It's almost like a kidney transplant, a liver transplant, a liver transplant, they, if you look at the bone as an organ, as a single organ, which we often don't look at. Again, for students in this audience, this is a fairly simple, uh, you know, the conventional Mendelian inheritance. If you have a father and one allele is labeled as M1, we know they're all linked together, the other allele is called M2 and the mother has two sets of chromosomes on which the alleles are there and you put them all as F1 and F2. So that's the permutation and combinations you can get of, your ch of the children of these two, this father and mother marry. So for the students out there in the audience, if you have one child who's M1, F1 and this family, this father and mother conceive again, what is the probability that the next child will also be M1, F1? Will be 25%. If they have one more child after that, what's the probability that it, they'll be still M1, F1? Okay, so it's a very small concept. It's important. I think most of you all understand. It's like a four-sided dice, okay? Every time you throw, the probability is only one in four. But the difference is, if you have more chances to throw, the overall probability tends to increase that you will get a donor of the same size. So as the family size are decreasing, you know, the probability that we will have a donor is becoming lower and lower. So the fundamental principle of transplant is you have a recipient and you have a donor who does not have thalassemia in this particular case. We have to go through this process of what we say conditioning the bone marrow. We kind of simple concepts is we have to empty the bone marrow and we also have to immunosuppress that the donor cells are adequately taken. And if you have ideally a HLA match sibling, you infuse a stem cells after this process called conditioning. And usually for a period of time, there are no cells either of the donor or of the recipient. And this is a very critical period in time when you have to take these patients through a lot of supportive care. And this often is a challenge in allogenic stem cell transplant. After engraftment, you have other challenges. Of course, occasionally patients can completely reject the graft, in which case you're going to essentially end up with an aplastic anemia. But occasionally patients can engraft successfully and then the immune system can actually attack the recipient just like it does in an autoimmune disorder. And that's essentially graft versus host disease. So again for students, most of bone marrow is done either from the bone marrow you actually harvest or it can be taken from the peripheral blood stem cells. But at the end of the day, it looks like this. It looks like a unit of blood which you essentially infuse into patients. Uh, and you know, a lot of students, at least you know, medical students who have not been exposed to this have still suspicions about bone marrow transplant in order to your bone, it doesn't. It's a unit of blood which is infused into patients after conditioning. The stem cells that you infuse are in this blood product. And it's an amazing thing about science and you need to never lose the awe and inspiration of medicine. These stem cells will form automatically into the bone marrow. Okay, and you can imagine the bone marrow like a fertile soil. It may not be so fertile sometimes, but the cells go sit there, then the plant grows, and the fruits are the red cells, white cells, and the platelets. So it takes a little time for this process to happen. Okay, so it's important to remember it like that. So if you were to compare transplant outcome versus no transplant in a Western setting. This has been done in, in Italy in a study where they looked at long-term survival in advance of a transplant. So this is looking at large number of patients, 258 patients, including those with, including 97 of them were adults who underwent a transplant, and they compared it with people who did not have a transplant, okay? And if you look at this, even if you take the whole population, the survival of the patients with transplant versus those who did not have transplant is comparable at 30 years. And even for adults, the survival is comparable, but the quality of life, no transfusions, no chelation after a period of time, makes quality of life dramatically better for patients who have undergone a transplant. But please stop for a minute and remember this is Western data. How many of you sitting in this audience have seen a 30-year-old thalassemia in your opinion? 
few and far apart. You know, we don't have good registry data. Most of our patients are dying in the second decade. Okay, so you take a even in a Western population with the best chelation and, and transfusion and support care, transplant survivals today are so good they're comparable to patients who are given the best of care. So you know, the quality of life is far better. Now, risk stratification. The conventional risk stratification includes these four parameters. It's called liver size, presence of liver fibrosis, and inadequate iron chelation. What is inadequate iron chelation? It's defined as failure to use chelation at an adequate dose within 18 months of the first transfusion. It was initially defined only in the context of desferioxamine. Of course, the chelation therapy has moved, and you could probably extend it to say adequate doses of currently available chelation. Liver size is a clinical examination, fairly fraught with problems. And the conventional classification came as class 1, class 2, class 3. If you had none of them, you were called good risk. If you had all of them, you were called very poor risk. And from Western data, we knew that class 1, 2 patients did well, and class 3 patients did not do so well. This is very large data from the Lucarelli group, the Italian group, which is the largest number of patients. To sum it up, basically the class 1, you're looking at survivals of 90%. The class 3, you're looking at survivals of 70%, but look at the thalassemia-free survivals in this large historical data. That means patients are surviving, but they've essentially lost the graph, and they become thalassemic again. And that's the discrepancy between the 79% and the 58%. So 58% only remain thalassemia-free okay, in the class 3. So the rejections, either early and late, are much higher in the class 3. At our center, we do a fair number of transplants. I'm not going to go through that in detail because of constraints of time, and that's our overall, all patients put together, overall in free survival. But for anybody working in India, we straight away know these classifications often put in the West, and actually, I, for students, you should know that any classification just put out there in the West, you cannot just take it and plant it in our center and say it will apply. There are dynamic, social, economic, financial, which are so dramatically different you cannot really apply those algorithms and they don't work for us, okay? So if you look at this, uh, if you look at class 1, class 2, class 3, for example, there were only about 25% of patients to 30% who are class 3 in this particular Italian study and about 30% who are class 1, okay? For our population, we know that even within the so-called class 3, let's look at these two patients, okay? One patient has a liver of three, the other seven centimeters. Both have inadequate chelation because that's a very loosely defined terminology. One has fibrosis. What is fibrosis? Some peripotal fibrosis is also fibrosis. Cirrhosis is also fibrosis. It's not, it's not black and white, it's a spectrum, okay? On top of that, you imagine patient one is three years of age, has no spleen, the other is 14 years and five centimeters. Anybody doing transplant in this room will tell you, man, you're going to run into a lot of trouble with this guy. But class three, they're both class three. You can't differentiate it, okay? So when we looked at our data and we really analyzed all the transplants done in our center, okay? It was very depressing and very sobering finding to know that there was a subset of class three that did very badly. And this went to a lot of statistical analysis. Basically, we found that people who were aged more than seven years, had a liver size more than five centimeters, had a class three, had an inventory survival, which was like 20%. In a disease like thalassemia, that's an indication you should not transplant this group. It is unacceptable to have mortality and rejection in this range, okay? And this data was subsequently, that was in 2009, in 2010, the EBC VMTR essentially confirmed this data with about the same age and parameters. And that gave rise to the concept of the class three as a subset called class three high risk. And what was much more important is in our analysis is Almost 70% of our patients were class 3, and you hardly had any patients in class 1. So in reality, the conventional classification really did not apply. Things will change as our economy changes, as our healthcare delivery changes, this will change. And so what has been stated is not written in gold. In fact, if you look at the EBMT classification, again looking at all these parameters, the ages have changed. Now they've said 14 years is good. You know, So these, these parameters will change as the economics and the di dimensions of our initial treatment changes. Okay, shifting gears from here, we're going to talk a little bit about how are we going to increase, improve the outcomes in this high-risk group of patients. So, just to deviate it before going to that little bit, we had done a fair amount of data on cellular and immune reconstitution. The objective is not to go so much into that, but just to challenge the dose of the C34 stem cell dose that we use. 
The conventional data was that it's 6 million, okay, for bone marrow, and we generally don't go about this. In our retrospective analysis, we found that patients who had a higher cell dose, okay, above the median, which is 7.3 in this case, had a much better outcome. And the pediatric population is different from the adult population. The overall incidence, especially with the bone marrow, of chronic GVHD is actually very low compared to adults. Okay? So we would tend to use a higher stem cell dose. When we had this figure that I showed you in our class 3, the first reaction was, let's cut back on the dose. So the concept of reduce the intensity of the conditioning regimen. And that actually was a little bit of a disaster for us because it did not serve the purpose and we had more rejections, though patients did survive the conditioning, very similar to what the Italians had done. And for the most part, if you look at the data that's out there, people have stayed away or shied away from complete reduced intensity conditioning regimens in these kind of conditions where there are heavy and highly intensive transfusions like plastic anemias which are heavily transfused, or if you look at thalassemias which are heavily transfused, the risk of rejection seems to be higher. The other question that is often asked of patients is, I'm not sure to show you the data, this is published and available. You often get patients with these big screens, and you're always wondering, should I do a splenectomy before I transplant, or should I just take them up for a transplant? This is real world situations, okay? And our data would suggest there's really no benefit of a splenectomy. In fact, if a patient has had a splenectomy and has come to you, he's probably going to do badly, not so much because of splenectomy, but because it's a surrogate marker of a patient who has been managed badly in the past, and he is much more likely to be our so-called class 3 high risk. Okay, so it's not the splenectomy per se. The other question that is often asked of you is somebody comes to you with HCV positivity. HCV positivity by itself is not a contraindication to go forward with transplant, provided there is no active hepatitis. Okay, so that's also an important concept. So to improve the outcomes in thalassemia, one of the early publications by Sodani et al. There is this complex algorithm of hydroxyurea, azathioprine, etc., going on for almost 45 days and then transplant, and they showed very good outcomes in their class 3, not the class 3 high risk patients, showing a significant improvement in survival compared to their earlier published data. This data has not really been reproduced by many other centers in, 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 in total, so we're really not sure. But what attracted our attention was this data by uh, Locatelli's group using triosulfan. Triosulfan is an analog of, uh, of busulfan. Some of the interesting things about it is it's much more easy to handle in terms of uh, solubility, etc. The pharmacokinetics is much more reliable. The interpatient variability is much less. <coughs> and it has been used for treatment of malignancies for a long time and also been used in, the tran in transplant. But what is most important about triosulfan is, in the phase one and phase two studies, there's very little heterotoxicity in contrast to busulfan. Okay, and uh, this is something that for patients who deal with transplants will tell you, especially in your class three high risk group of patients, you're likely to have fair amount of heterotoxicity and sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. Okay, and these can be really significant in due to multi organ failure and and uh, death. So in their data, they had shown very good results, and we had reproduced this data. This is again freely available online, with one little caveat. In our high-risk patients, when we use this regimen, we had a very high incidence of mixed chimerism when we use bone marrow. Again, for people who, who don't deal with this regularly, just so that you know, early, people will tell you, you know, you need only 20% donor cells and you'll have normal hemoglobin. All that is very true when it's late mixed chimerism. When it's early mixed chimerism, okay, and early mixed chimerism, I'm talking about less than 75%, less than 70%, the probability that you're going to remain stable mixed is very low in thalassemia. If you are an early mixed chimerism, very likely you're going to continue to lose the graft under some intervention. On the other hand, interpreting the same value of chimerism in a person who's doing very well at one year, two years, is a very different ball game. You don't need to jump and do anything. For the most part, he's going to be a stable mixed chimerism. So interpretation of chimerism at day 28 and day 60 is very different from interpreting uh, chimerism at a very late time point. But this was concerning for us, and we moved to a, uh, to a peripheral blood, and this data is published, is dramatically improved compared to our historical controls of our class three high-risk group of patients using Bucel. But I must, I must put a caveat over here, not everybody accepts this data. There are a lot of people who would still challenge it and say, you really don't need trio. If you use thiotipa as added onto that, that has more gonadal toxicity. 
So some of this is based on our experience. We are very comfortable this, with this with our class three, and sometimes centers get comfortable, they continue to use it. So I just don't want you to go out and say this is the only way to do it. And you can, of course, your center has to get comfortable with what they are doing. This is our story as far as our class three high risk group of patients come. When you look at umbilical cord blood transplant, there's a lot of att uh, attraction to this in the past. Again, you must remember when people say umbilical cord blood transplant is not one group, you have to talk about related umbilical cord and unrelated umbilical cord, and these are two different stories. A related umbilical cord is a brother or sister who was born and you, you harvest the stem cells, you immediately want to do a transplant.